If you'll open your Bibles to Galatians chapter 3, we resume our study of Paul's letter to the churches of Galatia. And you remember in the first two chapters, Paul has addressed the problem that had come to those churches. God had done a wonderful work through Paul in bringing the gospel, changing lives. But then those had come who were called Judaizers, those who taught that in order to truly be Christian, one must be Jewish. You need to be circumcised. You need to keep the dietary laws. You need to follow the Mosaic law. And there were those in the church who were giving careful attention to that, was causing serious issues in the church. And so Paul has addressed the situation in the context of the churches of Galatia. Now beginning in chapter 3, he argues theologically, if you will. It's typically Paul's pattern. And in the end of the book, the end of the letter, he will make practical applications of what he has just addressed. So in chapter 3, Paul begins to tease out the theology of what's going on and questioning them about what has happened in their lives. Galatians chapter 3, verse 1, this is the word of God. You foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Before your very eyes, Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed as crucified. I would like to learn just one thing from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by believing what you heard? Are you so foolish after beginning by means of the Spirit? Are you now trying to finish by means of the flesh? Have you experienced so much in vain, if it really was in vain? So again, I ask you, does God give you his spirit and work miracles among you by the works of the law or by your believing what you heard? So also Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. Understand then that those who have faith are the children of Abraham. Scripture foresaw that God would justify the Gentiles by faith and announce the gospel in advance to Abraham. All nations will be blessed through you. So those who rely on faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. For all who rely on the works of the law are under a curse. As it is written, Cursed is everyone who does not continue to do everything written in the book of the law. Clearly no one who relies on the law is justified before God because the righteous will live by faith. The law is not based on faith. On the contrary, it says the person who does these things will live by them. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who is hung on a pole. He redeemed us in order that the blessing given to Abraham might come to the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, so that by faith we might receive the promise of the Spirit. <coughs> the word of God for the people of God, thanks be to God. Can you imagine entering the Louvre in Paris with your paints, going directly to da Vinci's Mona Lisa, and adding your personal touches to improve his work? You say, that's absurd. Mm -hmm. Just as absurd as believing that we by our own works can add to or complete in any way the saving work of God in Christ Jesus. As Paul has addressed the situation to the Galatians, he now turns their attention to Scripture. And he argues with them, argue in the positive sense of reasoning with them. Of what are you thinking as you seriously entertain going to the law to complete or enhance or add to the salvation that's come to you in Jesus Christ? 
In verses 1 through 6, he challenges the Galatians to honestly consider the implications of following this false teaching. So in verses 1 through 6, I've just entitled the section, Think Through This. Think Through This. You notice verse 1, he says, You foolish Galatians. He uses foolish here in the sense of one who is not thinking clearly to make good choices. I don't know a parent of a teenager who hasn't used this same logic. Have you thought through this, son? Honey, are you thinking through the consequences of these choices you're making? That's what Paul is doing here. You foolish Galatians. Have you thought through the implications of this decision you're contemplating? He says, who has bewitched you? He says, it's as though you have had a spell cast upon you and you can't think clearly. Your mind is in a fog and you can't see the truth. What has happened to you? He says, the gospel was clearly preached to you. Jesus Christ was clearly presented to you as crucified. What's he saying? He's saying the gospel was preached clearly that Jesus Christ died on Calvary's cross for your sins. And by faith you receive that offer of grace from God. So that God reckons you Righteous, he puts the righteousness of Christ to your account and to you gives the righteousness of Christ. He says, I know that much. You heard the gospel and what you responded to was that message. And in verses 2 through 5, Paul asks these questions to make them think. Did you receive salvation as evidenced by the presence of the Holy Spirit by faith or by works of the law? Well, you know the answer to that was by faith. They hadn't experienced these realities. Those who were members of the Jewish synagogue, those who were Gentile, pagan, godless worshipers of idols, or those who were Gentiles who had come to the synagogue because they were seeking God. None of those people experienced a changed life and the infilling of the Holy Spirit by keeping any work of the law. Only when they had come to Christ. He says, in light of that, Verse 3, are you now seeking to complete by your own deeds what you first received by faith? You get the implication of the question, don't you? How absurd. When God has done this perfect work, you want to add to it, you want to complete it, What would happen to you if you tried to get into the Louvre with some paints? You wouldn't make it past security. But if you did, the painting is safe because it is covered in bulletproof, shatterproof, me-proof glass. You could never get to the painting itself. And if you could, Last I checked, that painting was worth $800 million, something like that. And you think you can add a little oil here and a little there and enhance that painting? You go, preacher, you'd be insane to even think that. That's what Paul's saying to these people. Why would you even think that you could improve on what Christ has done? Then verse 4, he says, have you suffered in vain? You see, they did suffer persecution. The Jews who didn't believe really made life hard on those who did. The Gentiles, as they were changed by the power of Jesus Christ, they quit going to some of the festivals and they quit participating in things that had been part of their life. Their families began to look down their nose. Their social circles ostracized them. 
In verse 5, he says, did you experience the realities of salvation? Miracles. The work of God that you'd never seen before in your own heart in the church. Did you experience the realities of salvation by keeping the law or by faith? No, all those things came before the Judaizers showed up. And then brilliantly, the Holy Spirit through Paul turns the whole discussion toward Abraham. You see just how deftly he does that? He said, boy, I wish I had a mind that worked like Paul's. He just seamlessly says, Abraham. You notice that in the text? So also Abraham. You experience those realities by faith, so also Abraham. Well, what's the big deal about Abraham? You got any Jewish friends? The Jews, especially in Paul's day, and Paul knew firsthand. Remember, he said in one place that he was a Hebrew of the Hebrews, a Jew of the Jews. The Jews reckoned their relationship with God to be predicated upon their physical descendancy from Abraham. We are Abraham's descendants. God's covenant was with Abraham. I will be your God and you will be my people. And we are his descendants. Jesus threw a rock at that machinery when he said, God can raise out of these stones sons of Abraham. And these who trusted that their physical relationship to Abraham guaranteed a spiritual relationship with Abraham's God went one step further and said, if we simply strive to keep the law of Moses, we're reckoned righteous. Missed the whole point of the law. So Abraham is foundational to their whole identity. That's where these Judaizers were coming from. And instead of beginning with Moses, Paul brilliantly goes back to the beginning to Abraham. You can't understand Moses without knowing Abraham. And he says, Abraham. So also Abraham believed God and it was credited to him for righteousness. What's Paul saying? He's saying even the uh, Abraham that these trust for their relationship with God, even Abraham was justified by faith, not by works. And he cites the verse. And so you see in verses 7 through 9 that Paul argues that Abraham is simply the father of all those who trust God, the father of the faithful. Understand then that those who have faith are children of Abraham. And he argues that in this covenant relationship with Abraham, one of the key tenets of that covenant relationship was that through you, Abraham, all peoples of the earth will be blessed. And Paul says, therein you have the gospel revealed to Abraham because it was through Abraham's descendant, Jesus of Nazareth, that all peoples, Jew, Gentile alike, can have relationship with their creator. They will be blessed through Jesus Christ. And that covenant was made with who? Abraham. It was based on what? Abraham's good works in God's behalf. No, by faith. God told Abraham these things and Abraham believed God. Some think that it was Abraham's believing that was magical almost. No, it wasn't Abraham's faith that saved him. It was Abraham's God that saved him. And the instrument he used was faith. Don't miss that. We don't glorify the faith. Faith is just the instrument. I have never seen a farmer glorify the hope. 
That's just the means to get the weeds out of the corn. And when the corn's on the table, who do we praise? The farmer who raised it. Same principle. Faith is the instrument God uses to reconcile us to himself. But it's not a work on our behalf that earns merit. It is the gift of God, Paul says. Ephesians 2, 8, 9. So we can't boast in anything but our God who has done this great work to bring us to himself in his son, Jesus Christ. Abraham is the father of all who trust God, the father of the faithful, as Paul told the Romans in Romans chapter 4 and verse 16. What's Paul's argument in these passages? That it's always been by faith. God's people have always been saved by faith. He said, no, the Old Testament saints were saved by the law. No, they weren't. They were saved by trusting the promise of God and their faith was expressed as they sought to obey what he had commanded them. We see clearly because we know the whole story. They really did live by faith that trusted God knowing that he would do what he promised even though they weren't quite sure exactly how. The sacrifices pointed to it and they believed that. And finally, in verses 10 through 14, Paul talks about trusting in works. It's like he says, okay, let's think about this. You want to trust works? You want to say that my works somehow are critical, essential to my salvation? What does he say in verse 10? For all who rely on the works of the law are under a curse. For the word says, the law says, cursed is everyone who does not continue to do everything written in the book of the law. Deuteronomy 27, 26. The law itself says if you don't perfectly keep this law, every jot and tittle, then you're cursed. You remember Jesus once again threw a wrench in things because as they challenged him in his teaching, he said, you think you keep the law because you haven't pulled the trigger and murdered someone, but I'm telling you, if you're angry with someone enough that you could do it or would like to do it in your heart, you have committed murder before God. If you've looked after a woman to lust after her before God, you're guilty of adultery. If you covet what your neighbor has, so that you're not content with what you have, you have stolen. Oh, they hated him for that. Because so many thought, well, hey, I hadn't murdered anybody, I hadn't committed adultery, I hadn't stolen anything. And Jesus says, yes, you have. And when you stand before the righteous judge, he will judge your thoughts as well as your deeds. And thus the law condemned them, not redeemed them. One pastor said the law exposes sin, it doesn't remove it. And in verses 11 and 12, you notice that Paul cites Habakkuk, the prophet Habakkuk 2.4. The prophet has poured out his lament, his complaint to God. He says, how can you judge us by people more wicked than we are? And he can't fathom, he can't get his mind around that and God reveals again who he is, who God is. And Habakkuk says, I can't live by looking around at what I see because the righteous live by faith. The dark clouds don't deter me from trusting God. I trust God even when I can't see what he's up to or how he could do it that way. Paul's argument, the righteous have always lived by faith. Justification has always come by faith. And then he points them to Jesus. 
He says, Jesus bore the curse of sin, the curse of the law for us. The law was never intended to save. The law was intended to reveal the holiness of God so that we would see how sinful we are, how desperately we need a Redeemer. And Jesus came, perfectly kept that law, and then was the perfect sacrifice, the lamb without spot or blemish who was sacrificed in our place. <coughs> Paul says, you didn't do anything to earn your salvation. Jesus did it all. And he points them where we must always point people, and that's Jesus. Jesus redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who is hung on a pole. And again, he quotes Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy 21, 23, God told the people when someone commits a heinous capital offense and they're executed, you take their dead body and you hang it on a pole so everybody can see how awful such sin is among my people. You remember the rest of that injunction? You take it down. You take that body down before the end of the day. Lest the land be defiled. And who hung between heaven and earth for us? You remember what they went to Pilate and asked? Can we get this body down, these three bodies down? It's a high holy day and darkness is coming. And if they're left up on those crosses, we will be reckoned accursed by God. That we haven't been obedient. Still worried about the details and miss the whole point. Paul says, Christ became your curse. You should have hung on that pole. You should have been displayed for the whole world to see that you break the law of God. You are a sinner. And then Paul goes back to Abraham and says, See, from the beginning, God has worked through faith. So that like the faith of Abraham, the Gentiles would come not by submitting themselves to the rigors of a law they can't keep, but so they could join their Jewish brethren at the foot of the cross and be made one in Christ Jesus. Now what about you this morning? Are you somehow seeking to add something to your redemption to do good works so that you can be reckoned good before God, somehow that God will be pleased with you. You see, the works that we do as believers flow out of that relationship. Not to make us right with God, but because we are right with God. World of difference. Now what about you? You say, well, I'm in the church. They said we're children of Abraham. So what? Well, you know, I think if I do enough good deeds, you will never do enough good deeds. Never. But I got to help God. You think God needs your help? Go back and read Job when God told him who he was again. No. You see, it's when we realize just how desperately condemned we are because of our sin that we fall at the foot of the cross and say, have mercy, save me. Why do you think the hymn writers would write such songs about the joy and the blessedness of being washed in the blood of the Lamb? Though your sins be as scarlet, they should be white as snow. 
Are you trusting Christ alone for your salvation? Are you walking in that truth if you have? The good news is if you hadn't, today's the best day I know of for you to do that. And if you have, rejoice. Remember the price paid for you. And walk in the freedom Jesus purchased for you. Free to follow him. Free to know him. Free to love him by faith. It's always been by faith. It will always be by faith. God saves and the instrument he uses is faith. So quit looking at the hoe and quit praising the hoe and start looking to God and praising him for the glorious redemption that's ours in Christ Jesus. Father, thank you. Thank you that that truth, that truth has stood and it has shown brightly that Jesus Christ has saved us by faith. Oh, that is shown brightly when your children have been thrown to the lions, when they've been beaten to death, when they've been burned at the stake, when they've stood beside countless graves and cried. Oh, Lord, when they've held sick and dying children, when they've sat and held the hand of a dying spouse, that faith has given hope and life, has brought peace in the midst of tears. Oh God, how we thank you that you have changed lives and you continue to do that for those who come to Christ. Receive his gift of a new life. Do it by faith. And then they walk by faith. And oh, what an adventure. What a pilgrimage it is. May we be a people of faith. Trusting you at all times, but especially when it's hard. Especially when it's dark. Love you, Lord Jesus. Thank you for dying on the cross for us. Fill our hearts with the certainty, the sure hope that's ours because of the good news of Jesus Christ who saved us by faith. And that we pray in his name. Amen.